except that one wall that still stands, you know, but it's gone. It doesn't even exist there. But now we have a new temple, if you will. That's the temple that Simeon had in his arms, you know. And that's the temple who he addressed, you know, like the Theotokos who held him in her womb. You see? Now we have a new temple. Like St. Paul says in another place, not made with stones and bricks <coughs> and mortar and all of that, but made with flesh and blood, made with human beings, with us. So that's, um, that's the beauty of the kind of transformation. That's why we have this epistle today, the transformation. Like we have to think new all the time. All the feasts cause us to think new about ourselves and about a new relationship with God. We are not like so separated from Him anymore, right? That we can only find Him in the temple, like in the Holy of Holies, and that a sin offering has to be uh, given. Like <coughs> Joseph and Philopokos <coughs> were poor people, so they could only well, they couldn't offer like the lamb and all the big. They offered two little pigeons, you know, two turtles. <laughs> Two little turtle doves. That's all they could offer. And so, but even then, what was that for? Normally, it's for expiation of the sins of the people. So in this case, an offering for the sins of this child, for the sins of this family, even bearing this child. So there were all these rites of purification, right? For the mother, for the child. So now what's this one for? Here you have Christ has no need of purification. Here you have the Theotokos herself who her womb was inviolate. No need for purification. Right? So what's this all about? It's to show, again, like Christ goes through every single phase <coughs> of the law. Every single thing. He doesn't disobey the law at all. Not one time. But he makes it something brand new, like I said. So in this case, as he proceeds to do this, he, how can we say it? He purifies the purification. <laughs> so we don't think in terms of purification rites anymore. Un unfortunately, sometimes it's still interpreted as a purification rite, like the 40 days for the woman and all of that. It's not necessarily just like a purification rite like the Old Testament. It's something new now. Now it's being carried in the arms of righteous Simeon the elder means now that we are one with God. Now the purification is to be coming in contact literally with the living God. Literally. So on, on this feast, right, it shows that a woman, for instance, who has a child and the child themselves are now not purified by like bloods of animals and all of that. Now they're purified simply by coming into the presence of Christ, into the presence of the living God. It's uh, holy. It's a reflection. It's a new thing. It's a reflection of my touching holiness. <coughs> That's it. So, we do that in all the mysteries. We do that in every single rite and in every single prayer. Prayers are not the Old Testament prayers anymore. They, re they literally crash God and man together, our prayers. We go into God and He goes into us. Otherwise, it's not a real prayer. It's not praying to God like out there, like in the Old Testament. It's praying to God out there and in here at the same time, in all places, in every, most especially in the inner chamber of my heart. So, when Simeon holds this child, he sees all this. He, he's understanding somehow this prophecy that he had been given 200 years before, and which caused him to live this long, ancient life, which I'm sure was no picnic either, you know, to live to two or three hundred years old. Like, Michael, you're not even a third of the way there? He <laughs> moved well, he did. By that time, the ages had started getting normal, like normal for us. So what happened was, this was a special blessing from the, from the angel. 
who said not only, because he was going to scratch out that part, remember, that said, a virgin shall bear a son. And the angel Gabriel said, no, no, that is the truth. And in fact, you will live to see the fulfillment of this prophecy in your lifetime. So the prophecy of Isaiah is filled in the arms of the righteous Simeon. And he looks and he says, I understand. I experience it. I can be part in peace now, because now I, I know, like, not only with my feeble, you know, ridiculous mind, which was going to do that, but now I understand with my whole being, like, how the transformation has taken place. Who knows what noetic things were going on in the, in the soul of Simeon at that time? Those very things are given to you, but they're not given to you cheaply. And they're not given to you like will they do. You have to want them. And you have to practice them. You have to go to the places where they are accessible. Where are they accessible? In confession, in communion, in any of the mysteries of the church, in any like holy, deified place. And especially right here. Anywhere, anytime we can go into the chamber of our heart and Invite, you could say, like, you know, attract God there. This is available to you. But you see, you have to take advantage of that availability. It's not just going to come. The, the Holy Spirit's not going to force you, not going to bomb you <coughs> with His grace against your will, like compel you somehow. It never happens, right? And in the, in the life of Simeon, it took all those hundreds of years for him to realize that. For him to say, okay, I'd like to see my salvation. I'd like to come in contact with, you know, like, what's, what's happening? Why am I still here? What's going on? And then finally, because he was open to that, because he was aware that something's going to happen one of these many years, 200 of them waiting, waiting, in one of these years it's going to happen, and in one of these moments in your life it's going to happen. You're going to come into contact with the living God, and you're going to hold it, not in your arms, but in your heart. And you're going to say, oh, now we're like that prayer of St. Simeon. Now it should have a new meaning for you when you think about it in the light of this feast. Now let your servant depart in peace. For my eyes, and we say like not just the physical eyes, my spiritual eyes, my noetic eyes, have seen my salvation. And your salvation to me have seen my salvation. Etc. And the rest of it, right? He's a light to the Gentiles and to the new, church, the new Israel, which is the church. And he's now in me and with me and among us. Hmm. How can it be the same? How can that feast, like where they sacrifice a couple of the pigeons, right? And put the blood and do all that. How can that be the same as this? Well, it is like that much. But it's not like this much. Because now it's exploded into something incredibly accessible to you. Not from far away. And not from, you know, a priest doing the sacrifice for you. Now the transformation, you know, the priesthood. Now the priest is doing the sacrifice with you. And, um, and so you can fully participate and embrace and consume the sacrifice and be part of the sacrifice. So even all of the sacramental life is something that was never before heard of before all of these feasts were transfigured into something other by Jesus Christ. Okay? That's why the feasts are so important. And that's why this one, you know, is, is quiet feast. You don't hear about this feast anywhere. Even in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, it's very small. Very, it's, it's just like, a, like a, a small feast. And it was that way, even in the Orthodox Church for the first five centuries, like I was saying last night, until all of a sudden, <coughs> it was revealed that this is a great feast of the Church because in the time of this feast, there was an earthquake, there was a, a famine, all kinds of problems that were healed, you could say, by the fasting and prayer at this time, on this feast. And the emperor and the people took it as a sign. This feast is not something just to like 
I said, oh, that's a nice feast. No. But, you, but the power of this feast, all those things that I just said, all the transfiguration of all those Old Testament realities, Christ was saying, something is real here. Something is new. So please, let's celebrate this feast. And now it's one of the twelve. And it's one of the great feasts. So, let's see. There's a few people here. The um, goal, you know, the vision is that nobody who's available, you know, not like uh, an emergency situation, misses any of the twelve feasts, if possible. Any of the twelve feasts. And if we have to change the times, you know, like to the middle of the night, so be it. If everybody can come to the twelve feasts. That's how, you know, like when you're making the schedule, when you're making your own weekly schedule or monthly schedule or annual schedule, is the first thing that goes on your calendar the feasts of the church? You know? Is it the first thing? And if it isn't, what is the first thing? So you have to see that. Okay, like, what's happening here? Yeah. Where's my priority? The first thing, feast of the church, yes, but so-and-so is getting married. Well, tell them to get married on another day. That's why in the Orthodox Church, we don't do weddings on the feasts. No <coughs> weddings on the, on the great feast of the church. In fact, really no weddings for the whole period of the after feast of the, you know, of the church as well. Like Pascha, no marriages during Brighton. Same thing. All the same understanding. Like, here's the first. I do all that first. And then I do all the big events in my life and all the way down, right? Why? Because of everything I just said. This is how real, how um, seriously we take the, the transforming power of Jesus Christ in our life. So if he can, if he can transform, you know, that Old Testament law, sacrifice, and all the rest, he can surely transform our calendars, right? So let, let the next feast, and the next feast, and the next feast be celebrated with <coughs> full glory, and not just three or four people. This is actually pretty good. I'm wondering if it's because it's a Saturday. So that's always a good thing to come on Saturdays. But we'll see when the next one is. And what we need to do to like maximize everybody's... It's like going away to a pilgrimage. It's like going away to paradise. To step in to another place. Today you've done that. Today, like, who cares? Like, What's going to happen? You'll, you'll go back to your business, you know, after you celebrate this feast in the best way, which is to unite with Jesus Christ. And think of nothing else in the meantime. Yes, amen.